I'm Mike Jansen from Denver, and <clears throat> I think we have a great group of uh, four very classic articles today. The reason we picked all these is they all kind of revolve around cost-efficient medicine, of looking at different ways to do particular technologies at the most cost-effective way in surgery centers rather than at the hospital, per se. Um, both in ambulatory surgery center models, uh, decompressions, uh, total disc replacement, how you do blood salvaging in surgery centers and a variety of things. So I thought it would, it would add a different element by looking at uh, as we're getting more conscious, and I think us as physicians have to be very conscious about where we do things and what the cost is to the patients and to the healthcare. So I think we picked four articles that would generate a lot of good discussion and kind of highlight them today. So we're gonna start off first by our new associate, Jake Grumley, who just recently joined us and has a, uh, and is gonna share his uh, thoughts and experience uh, on a particular topic. All right, uh, thank you. All right, so uh, we I chose this article uh, mostly because when I came out of uh, my fellowship at uh, Medical College of Georgia with John Devine, uh, there was not a lot of talk about surgery centers, things like that, because that's not a part of uh, some academic centers. And before that, I was in the military, which uh, surgery centers are 0% of. So uh, a lot of fellows are now going to be looking at contracts and trying to evaluate what they want to do. And understanding that there's these different uh, surgery center models, I think, is important because they're all very different. They all have uh, some different aspects to them which can be profitable or, uh, or risky. So it's good to have a base understanding of this. And I think that this article uh, uh, by Bedlani is excellent. It kind of quickly going over that. So at least it gets you into the conversation before your lawyer looks at the contract. So uh, what we're gonna hope to show today, not with this, but with uh, uh, the three other articles is that uh, these surgery centers provide a lower cost to the patients. Uh, they're generally safe, but uh, you know, a added bonus is they allow physicians to share in the healthcare profits, uh, you know, because as costs are going up, not, not necessarily to the patient alone, but you know, with uh, medical records costs and things like that, it's becoming harder and harder for the uh, physician to really uh, be able to uh, make a profit uh, in, in these times. You know, they, uh, many people talk about that the good old days are gone, but uh, this may be a way for us to recapture some of the costs. So uh, surgery centers uh, allow for good patient cost savings and that's to the patient alone because there's less administrative hierarchy in some of these large hospital systems. And there's a different goal a lot of times. Uh, it's not just to get more patients into your center, but you have to manage the cost of every patient. You know, so uh, like Adam Smith's, uh, you know, way of creating industry to drive profits, you do less different surgeries, you have less instrument sets, you're more focused in what you can do, and then you can bring down the cost of each of those things that you do. Uh, and additionally, you don't have an ER that you have to cover the uninsured patients that are coming in who are unable to uh, pay for their care. So you're not passing those costs on uh, to the patient. Now, this must be working because from 1995, when there were really no uh, ambulatory surgery centers to uh, when this article uh, was written, they quoted that there's 5,300 ambulatory surgery centers. And you can see that graph on the left that it's been just an absolute vertical increase, uh, you know, and steadily increasing by year, the number of surgery centers. I, I would like to see what COVID has done to this, if this has affected it. But, but in general, this is uh, becoming more prevalent. And spine surgeries are being performed more and more as we've learned and as technologies have maybe improved, not necessarily just on the spine side, but in the medical management side, it's safer to do these at surgery centers. And we're learning that we may be able to do these in a, in a setting where it's more profitable. So the economics of these, they tend to be, uh, you know, according to these procedures, which are not spine, uh, about half the cost. Uh, uh, according to this article, you save about $350 to the patient if you do a laminectomy at a surgery center. We'll cover that in a, a later article, but, but it's cheaper for the patient. That's a good thing. But I think that uh, as this has become more and more uh, noted, we've also found that uh, the payers are less willing to pay for these surgeries uh, at surgery centers. So the reimbursement for them is also going down. Uh, in this uh, article, they quoted 82% decrease in payments to the uh, surgery centers themselves. So who who's involved in these surgery centers? Who are the ones who are gonna be uh, uh, owning them. Well, there's physicians like uh, Dr. Jansen, 
uh, there's surgery management companies. Envision is just one of them. It's uh, by no means a part of any of my practice or any of my ownership, but uh, they have a beautiful logo. And lastly, the hospitals. The so hospitals are a big uh, owner in these and they're becoming an increasingly larger owner in these. And a lot of uh, physicians kind of sometimes feel at odds with the hospitals, but uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the devil, right? They, they actually bring a lot to the table. So the most commonly owned, or the most common model, 65% of these are solely physician owned. Now, understand that there are some requirements if it's a solely physician to own practice. So it's an exception to Stark Law. You, uh, according to this article, you have to perform a third of your cases at the ambulatory surgery center that you own. So those are some considerations to really think about. And if you're gonna buy in, uh, you know, they can't sweeten the deal to try to uh, recruit a new physician. They have to pay a fair market value, which is based on local rates. And, you know, some of these laws may differ um, uh, by state to state on what you're able to do and things like that. If you're allowed to have a uh, three days uh, patient admission versus just overnight or not even staying overnight at all. But those are some considerations. And you as a physician are gonna get paid based on your ownership, not your volume, which for some surgeons buying in may be a big concern because you ha may have people who own large portions that uh, are not doing as many cases. As a physician, you're gonna have to cover the management costs, day-to-day -day, uh, overhead, but you have more autonomy and you may uh, though be able to employ a management company who does not own a surgery center, like some of the later models, but uh, they will help manage some of the administrative costs or uh, administrative uh, tasks, and you pay them for service. So that brings us to the management companies, some of the uh, larger ones uh, there on the right. Uh, you know, they this is different than the last model, and they actually share in the ownership. Now, they can have a majority shape or uh, share, they can have a uh, minority share, but this is the model where they, they uh, do that. And with this management company, they carry leverage because there's they're able to go to insurance companies and say, for this procedure to be done in our uh, facilities, and we have a lot of facilities, we want you to reimburse us at this rate. So that brings some power. Uh, they also are used to doing these administrative things where many of us surgeons, I, I was never trained how to, uh, uh, you know, uh, do executive functions outside of medicine. So that can be very helpful and it can keep you out of trouble. Uh, they are also uh, required to follow the same standards as a physician only owned practice. And, you know, in the end, make sure that you research the percentage uh, of the management company ownership because if they own more than 51%, they're technically your boss. Now, you bring the two groups that don't always get along, which are the physicians and the hospitals, okay? So hospitals are generally trying to recoup some of their lost income because remember, before these ambulatory surgery centers, these were all done at hospital outpatient uh, departments. So they were they were making hand over fist off these, and now we, uh, to some hospitals, feel that they've, they've stolen these, we've stolen these uh, procedures from them. So their, their end goal is to recapture some of these at low cost. Now, once again, hospitals, even more than uh, the uh, management companies can really recoup a lot of the uh, costs by increasing the rates of payment. They are very strong at doing this in, in contracting and leveraging. <laughs> they can also uh, view this as, and I think if you go to one of these uh, hospital owned or if they're gonna buy in, you need to make sure you say, hey, listen, this is opening up beds, especially in a time like COVID. This is gonna keep inpatient beds and you can bring your non-sick patients over here at a lower rate uh, risk. Um, hospital systems also have more financial strength, so sometimes they can bring stability. So the, the uh, maybe best uh, model is when you have a physician, a hospital and a management company, but anytime you get three parties involved in anything, you're bound to have some issues and some problems. And frequently the hospital and the management company will buy in together and they will control a majority share. So if the hospital owns 60% of, or 51% of that 60%, they've essentially taken power. So make sure you keep an eye on that. But once again, uh, the hospital player, the management company player, they bring a lot to the table. Uh, they bring some stability, but maybe a little less profitability. And this can easily slowly turn into a hospital owned with physician management. So the last model I'll kind of bring up is 
and the hospital can own it and they can ask physicians, come on, uh, come in here, make it run. Uh, and I think it's because they understand that we have a goal of getting things done efficiently and that really helps their profit margins. Um, the, the biggest problem with these is that uh, sometimes uh, you can be the employee of the hospital, even though you're co-managing, they're paying you for what you do, they're gonna give you a percentage of your collections maybe. In the end, uh, if things become tight at the hospital, that can affect you. So it's the least independent, but it comes with maybe a little more financial uh, stability. And hospitals known that the doctors run hospitals and healthcare the best when it comes to uh, making it profitable. So I would say if you're if you're going to take anything from this article, first of all, nothing is the best model. There's a lot of different models. You should just know what they are. Have your lawyer read your contract before you buy into any of these. Understand that with decreased ownership is not bad. It's less risk to you as a physician, but you're probably going to have less profit. And also, have a lawyer read your contract and have a lawyer read your contract. So thank you. Okay, great. Thanks, Jake. And we got a few minutes for discussion on this particular one before we go into specifics. Um, any uh, Anyone want to comment or tell them about their stories? I mean, the big issue, I think, here is this was published in 99 or 2000, and there's been a lot of changes since then. But there's a lot of different state regulations. And when some, when I listen to people talk about this is done in ASC and this is done as an outpatient, different states have different regulations. Um, fortunately, in the state of Colorado, we have an ASC with what's called a convalescent license, so we can keep patients up to three days. It gives us higher acuity to do cases rather than patients that sometimes have to go directly out the door on that same day. But every state is, a, is somewhat uh, a little bit different. And I, we have seen that hospital-based employees have been forced to do cases that should be done as an outpatient, simple like an arthroscopy at inpatient rates, which when patients have a 90-10 plan or an 80-20 plan, that adds a huge cost to the underlying patient. Um, Jack, can you want to comment on what you guys have in, uh, in the Plano area and, and, and how ASCs have changed and what kind of things you can do in ASC compared to an inpatient facility? You know, we, we sort of have a hybridized model because we have uh, a part ownership in a hospital, um, a short stay hospital, where the large hospital system is our 51% partner, as Jacob said. And um, we use that uh, as an ASC. There are other ASCs in, in our community um, with different models. We also have some ownership in another hospital system that has the three partners, you know, that has the management company, the physicians, um, and the hospital. So, you know, we've sort of dabbled in, in several of these. Um, other than the fact that we don't have an independent uh, TBI ASC, uh, kind of surprisingly, because we've been able to, to do it within our um, hospital, short stay hospital system to everyone's satisfaction so far. Uh, and, but I would say the one model I was going to ask Jacob about is the one where the physicians are compensated for a management role. I think that's a dangerous one um, because you can't compensate every physician uh, with a with a title uh, without a big red red light, you know, blinking on top of the building uh, where the federal government <laughs> uh, homes right in there with the black helicopter. So that that model sort of uh, is of some concern. Um, versus the other ones, which I think can be set up in a, in a very legally and uh, uh, efficient uh, model. Yeah, I, I agree. It's, at that point, you essentially, it's just a hospital in a different building, and they're, they're just giving you a percentage of what you are bringing in. I mean, to me, it almost seems just like an employed physician model, but they're calling it an ASC. So these, yeah. these lines become very gray. Jens, do you have anything in uh, in Seattle um, now that you're away from the university for the last few years in an ASC model, or is everything at inpatient rates at Swedish? So uh, Swedish actually has one of those co-management models. Uh, they have an outpatient surgery center uh, with a 49% ownership. Uh, for me, it's not uh, of interest at all to do anything there because it's uh, geographical but inconvenient. Uh, and I have a maxed out schedule as is. So uh, yes, Swedish actually has this kind of a model and one of my partners at MIS uh, uses this, but for me again, it's just not uh, personally relevant or interesting. And I think Jacob put it very nicely. This is just a, a, a different OR with a hospital um, staff that's kind of pretty much the same as everywhere else. So. Uh, I, I have several friends 
like you guys who have absolutely amazingly run outpatient surgery centers. And when I compare their outfits to what we have here, and I'm not putting them down, again, the, uh, the nimbleness and the efficiency of a truly surgeon-run outfit is bar none. Uh, it is uh, truly amazing how if there's one person who's actually doing the procedures is in charge, how well choreographed the whole outfit runs, together with a very good anesthesiologist who's on board. Our surgery center here is, again, a variation, quoting Jacob again here, of the main hospital OR, it's just in a different location. Thanks. Any other comments among our team? I mean, the other question, uh, the only thing I wanted to correct you, Jacob, is that when you said that the regulations from Stark is that you can't, you have to do one third of your cases there, it's one third of your eligible ASD right. cases. And that means that, you know, if you do a lot of complex surgery, but only a third of these would be eligible to go to an ASC, that's the cases you have to monitor, not your overall cases from a Stark regulation. Most of the time I've been involved in these joint ventures. Um, we started one where it was all surgeons. We sold half, 51% of the hospital. The reason sometimes they want 51 percent is because in our in our state, in order to be on their contracts, which they get better contracts through the big HCA organization, they had to have 51 percent. Otherwise, we wouldn't have got their contract rates, which are actually better than the individual ownership by the docs. But every every state is a little bit different to that to that extent. But I agree with you. For me, when we build a surgery center uh, in 1999 and 2000. We never really cared if it made money. It was about efficiency because physicians, you have a lot of control of everything that you do and your talents and CME and where you go. But the most important thing is the control of your efficiency in the OR. Um, and so, you know, we, we came out of it from a different model about looking how efficient things can be. You know, we can start at 7.30, 6.30 in the morning whenever we want, but we couldn't get that done at the hospital. Okay, great. Next. Okay. All right. Just trying to get the control, see if it's going to advance. So Clay, Clay published this uh, study when he came and to spend time with us as a resident, and we're very fortunate that he- Rumley, well, here. Dr. Jansen, Dr. Rumley are my attendings. So the article I was um, going to present today is was published in the Spine Journal in 2020. <laughs> this is primary single level lumbar microdiscectomies and decompressions at a freestanding ambulatory surg surgical center versus um, ones performed at a hospital owned outpatient department. And they looked at analysis of 90 day outcomes and costs. So I think this is a really important thing to talk about and um, try and understand the differences in complication rates and costs between the ambulatory centers and the hospital owned outpatient facilities. And this gets highlighted in the mainstream media. Dr. Jansen and I have actually talked about this uh, USA Today article that was published in 2018, where they looked from 2013 through 18, and they go to list all of these scary complications and even mortalities performed at surgery centers. So really it falls on us as physicians and the ones that own the surgery centers and control them to provide data to show that it's safe as well as cost effective. So what are the differences between the two? I think Dr. Rumley did a, um, a great job already kind of explaining this. Basically the freestanding ambulatory surgery centers are largely owned by physicians and provide uncomplicated surgical procedures and patients typically go home the same day as the procedure um, unless you live in a state that has the ability to have a convalescence care center like we do here in Denver, um, whereas the hospital owned outpatient facilities are more of a co-management model that we were just talking about. They have some ability to provide more 24 seven emergent care and provide access to a, a wider variety of specialty service, which includes procedures that may have a negative operating margin. So this study was a retrospective cohort study that utilized data from the Humana Administrative Claims Database um, and they queried data from 2007 to 2014. Um, and in order to um, improve the statistics, they did a one-to-one -one propensity match on the basis of age, gender, race, region, and comorbidity index. Um, so people that were included in this study were single-level lumbar microdiscectomies, laminotomies, and minimally invasive or percutaneous decompressions. They excluded two-level surgeries, open laminectomies, um, fusions, revision, disectomies, and deformity surgery. 
So overall, they had 11,552 patients that met inclusion criteria. Uh, 1,077 or 9.3% of these were actually performed in the ambulatory setting, um, whereas 10,475 or 90% were uh, performed in the hospital outpatient department. Um, when they performed the one-to-one -one propensity match, they got 990 patients that, um, for both groups. So this is just uh, looking at the unmatched characteristics of the patients. Um, if you compare the two groups before they did the propensity matching, the hospital facilities had an uh, older patient population where 12.9% of patients were greater than 75 versus the ambulatory surgery centers, which seven, it was only 7.9%. Um, one, it was kind of interesting, the hospital facilities had 3.4% 3. 3 of African-American patients and only 1.1% in the ambulatory centers. Um, and the hospitals were more likely to have Medicare Advantage plan versus ambulatory, which was more likely to have commercial plans. Um, and then there was regional differences as well with hospital-owned facilities more common in the South and the West. And the hospital-owned facilities also had a higher comorbidity burden. And this is the demographics after they matched the patients. Um, so overall, they found that there was no statistically significant difference in 90-day all-cause complications. They had similar rates of emergency department visits and similar rates of readmission. And of course, these are after they had propensity matched everything. So this is just a chart listing the different complications um, that they looked at, um, wound complications, pulmonary complications, cardiac, um, and they looked at readmissions and emergency department visits as well. Um, and they were, they were all similar between the ASC as well as the hospital department. Um, as far as cost savings goes, I think this was the, what they found to be statistically significant is um, ASCs typically uh, charged $2,000 less than the hospital departments and the commercial um, insurances they got um, about a $3,507 dollar uh, savings compared to the hospitals. And that's detailed in the chart below as well. So limitations to this study were that it was a, a Humana Administrative Claim Database query. It doesn't include clinical level data and you lack preoperative functional data. Um, you're also unable to obtain the socioeconomic characteristics that may drive decision-making for outpatient versus inpatient treatment. And then also you were unable to determine the degree of physician ownership for ambulatory surgery centers that were studied. So in conclusion, for single-level lumbar disectomy um, or decompression, ambulatory surgery centers provide substantial cost savings with no significant impact on complications, post-operative emergency room visits, reoperation rates, or readmission rates. Thank you. Thank you, Clay. Can I make a question or a comment to you? So <clears throat> the authors here tried to do a propensity analysis. And again, uh, as somebody who plays with larger databases on some regular basis, I have a continued deep suspicion as to the ability of our databases to appropriately quantify comorbidities of patients. So um, there are several things here that you very appropriately pointed out are strongly suspicious, just even in this uh, database of uh, a bias, a selection bias of who gets to go into an ASC and who doesn't. And the, the factors that lead towards that selection are very complex. And the statistical modeling to try to ameliorate such a bias are nothing but modeling. They are an attempt at trying to kind of cushion things by either cherry picking some or doing kind of matched analyses or just putting a coefficient in to kind of uh, dampen the effect. But they're modeling. So how do you uh, defend this kind of apparent cherry picking which took place in the ASC group compared to the other group? So I, th I think that's, like you said, one of the strongest limitations of the article. Um, I think in order to have a, a good comparison, you have to do more of a prospective uh, study where you have more in-depth information about the about the patients themselves. Well, when you talk about cherry picking, Jens, I mean, 
That happens to me every day. I walk in and I'm at the hospital doing a decompression. And the first thing I say to my team is, why isn't this done at the surgery center? Less cost, uh, more efficient, um, easier for the patient to get out, less risk of all the sick patients in the hospital. And then they'll say, well, my, this guy has a stent. He's got hypertension. He's X, Y, and Z. So we are trying to look, and I think we have to look at the comorbidities to decide which patient should be done at which facility and what where is the real low risk. Hey, uh, I, I'd like to make that, that I've uh, experienced with our setup in Plano where we've got hospitals, HOPDs, and ASCs is the patient perception. And I don't really hear anybody talking about that. I'm not sure a lot of the patients even understand the differences between all these. And I do think the outcome of whether the surgery is done in an ASC versus an HOPD or a hospital itself is dependent a bit on the patient perception. I'll do the same case in a hospital and that person feels it's a resort area. They can stay in house for three or four days and it's like drag, there's nail marks on the wall as I'm trying to drag patients out of hospital because they're ready to go. So we've got to work on patient education when we're talking about these various tiers of care. Yeah, and to follow up on Jens's comment, I think that this the simple answer or perhaps the cynical answer is it is all about the money. I mean, if you look at, yeah, sure, Medicare patients may have higher comorbidities, but if you look at the data, the, the choice is you, you do the lower reimbursing case at the hospital and the higher reimbursing case at your ASC. I think Mike you know, made a comment earlier that when they first set theirs up, it was about efficiency. But what's efficiency? Efficiency is being able to get more cases done, economics. And I would say that in the most recent ASC explosion, I would say it's all about the economics. And, and in fact, we're, we're being played by the insurance companies. They're not our friends. They love the fact that, that we're pushing the envelope and doing cases in ASCs that are kind of more gray zone because their contracts allow them to reimburse less for ASCs. You know, and frankly, most of our patients have commercial insurance, so we're really not saving significant amount of money for the patient. We're saving money for the insurance companies. Um, and, and they found a perfect storm because, you know, we can have ownership in ASCs where we can't in, in hospitals. So, you know, we, we've created a perfect storm. It, it, it's working for us right now. It's working great for the insurance companies. You know, and, and frankly, the satisfaction ratings, as Izzy uh, pointed out, for some of these uh, smaller, more efficient ASCs or short-stay hospitals, patients do love them, and, and infection rates are lower. And so, you know, it actually works for the patient as well. But I would say the number one driving mechanism is, is economics. So let me just... Uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it's actually not such a bad thing. You look what we get reimbursed. So this is a way for the physicians to have some ancillary income. But as you know, in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, what's happening um, as far as the independent AESCs, most of them have some type of joint venture, and Jack sort of alluded to it, where you have a major hospital corporation that is major owner and the surgeons are quote-unquote minor, although... You know, for example, in our uh, situation, it's a short-stay hospital, and they call it physician-owned, even though the hospital system owns 51 percent. So, you know, in uh, you know, diminishing reimbursements, this way for us to keep our income up. The, the most important thing, though, is the patient safety. And, uh, for example, at our facility, we have very, very rigid criteria for patients who can have their surgery here, even though we are a hospital, we're a short-stay hospital. And I think that's the most important thing. And, you know, Jens alluded to that, and I think that we are very, very careful. For example, we don't have any uh, ASC or ASA uh, 3 or um, greater patients that are have surgery in those will do a three, but not a four or a five. If they have a BMI over 40, then if they're having neck surgery, we don't do them here if they have multiple levels. So we have certain restrictions and criteria to try to make it safe for the patient, even though we have a, a real hospital, just not with an ICU. So let me just add one more perspective to this, and that is um, I want to add to what Scott said. Whenever in the history of surgery in the U.S., uh, we have created something that's more efficient, whether it's a procedure, how we do a procedure, or, for instance, a whole process like an ambulatory surgery center, what this has led to is for the reimbursement for us as physicians to go down. 
This is a great excuse for insurance companies to basically just ratchet the whole spiral downwards. We call that the Walmart effect. So the big bully, the Walmart effect hits us all. So in a way, ASCs have actually been whilst for the short term, a great and very alluring income generator for our physicians. In the big picture, it's really pushed us very hard and will harm our reimbursement because if you do hard work for something, you're just gonna get paid less. And for instance, when we have one of our catastrophe patients who we have to operate on, a whatever 380 pound disabled person with a caught equine or a rod, rod the other day had a 600 odd pound person with beginning caught equina. And basically, his insurance carrier, he actually, believe it or not, had the commercial insurance, said this is a one-night hospital stay. Now, this Colossus uh, uh, consumed four gallons of uh, pop a day. This is not a joke. And again, this is obviously a very significant crisis, and we have to upcode to try to justify stay, and he has to write multiple appeals letters. But so we're, are we really doing ourselves in the big picture a favor by kind of having more efficient processes or procedures, or is this actually something that uh, just is an excuse to kind of have other third-party entities like insurance carriers maximize their profits? Thank you. Yeah, it's just like us being good Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and developing algorithms based on, on good data and then having it taken by an insurance company as a cookbook so that now you cannot get anything approved that doesn't fit you know, the algorithm as if it was an absolute instead of a scientific probability. So um, you're right, we kind of play right into the hands of the people who are going to come and put the shackles on us. Jens, yeah, we, we lost this battle a long time ago. We were at the bottom of the feeding chain or the food chain. I agree, Jens. <laughs> but if anybody's going to control costs and efficiencies, the physicians need to take that role. Okay. And uh, obviously, you know, we, we lost that a long time ago, but that is extremely important. If you really want to control the efficiency and the direction of the cost of health care, the big aircraft carrier, which is a hospital, is clearly not going to do that. And we have to take that as a role. Okay, let's go to two more topics uh, within the uh, confines of surgery centers. Uh, we have both uh, uh, the safety of multi-level uh, uh, disc replacements as well as uh, blood products uh, on total discarthroplasties at ASCs. Great, Christina? thank you so much. So uh, my article uh, that I'm presenting today uh, discusses, kind of changes the, the topic and, uh, and shift over to uh, total disc replacements. So this was an article published in Spine in 2019, uh, case series out of uh, Cedar sinai um, talking about the safety of both single and multi-level cervical uh, disc replacement. And I'm gonna, there we go. Uh, so just as an introduction, a lot of this we've, we've uh, discussed already, uh, but as healthcare costs rise, there's been a push to perform more uh, cases and, and proportion of spine surgery to uh, surgery centers. Uh, there are lots of articles and reports of high rates of safety, economic efficiency, and patient satisfaction. Uh, there's been two large recent uh, national database studies on uh, single level cervical disc replacements uh, that show lower rates of infection and unplanned hospital admission in cases that are done in, in uh, surgery centers. However, uh, there's a, a significant limitation to these studies that outpatient has been defined as uh, discharge the same day or post-op day zero. So we don't really know if, if these surgeries were performed in a surgery center or a hospital. They were just discharged on the same day. However, um, very little has been published on multi-level cervical disc replacement in uh, surgery centers. Um, Gordon et al. Uh, compared cervical ADR in uh, surgery centers versus a hospital setting, included uh, up to two-level disc replacement and reported lower rates of complications. So in this study, uh, it's a retrospective study, uh, consecutive patient uh, case series of all cervical disc replacements among the three surgeon authors in three uh, surgery centers over a nine month period plus the 90 day uh, post-op global period. Uh, procedures included single and multi-level ADR and revision cases. Patient selection um, wasn't particularly well-defined, uh, minimal uh, medical comorbidities and ideally have a BMI less than 30. Uh, patients were monitored in the recovery room in PACU for an average of three hours. Discharge uh, criteria 
Uh, patient had to be ambulatory with their pain controlled, had to avoid, tolerate uh, PO intake without any swallowing difficulty, throat swallowing or respiratory difficulty. Uh, results, and I have a couple of charts in my next uh, slides. Uh, they looked at 147 uh, total patients that underwent 231 levels of cervical ADR. Um, most of them were single and uh, two level cases, but there were a few three and uh, one four level um, case. Uh, eight of these patients uh, were undergoing a revision approach. Uh, 130 or 90% were discharged directly home, 10% to an aftercare facility, which is defined as a hotel with a nurse. Uh, most of these they uh, noted were patients that were from out of town. Um, and so they stayed locally with a, with a nurse. Um, there were two unplanned uh, hospital admissions. Both patients had a two-level surgery. Uh, the first was for intractable nausea and vomiting on post-op day six, uh, which uh, turned out to be esophagitis from uh, uh, increased anti-inflammatory use. And then there was a superficial uh, surgical site infection that was uh, admitted on post-op day seven. Uh, this chart basically just um, defines what I what I went over as far as uh, the demographic information uh, for folks. Uh, while they did uh, like to limit um, patients with a BMI over 30, 20% uh, of their patients uh, did have a BMI over 30. Um, surgical parameters, this just kind of summarizes um, um, which uh, levels they did and, and some of the um, things that they looked at with these patients. So most commonly C5-6 and C6-7 uh, were the most common levels. Uh, the mean uh, average total anesthesia time for these patients was 88 plus or minus 25 minutes uh, with a range of 39 to 168, which they did uh, discuss quite a bit in the uh, discussion section. And then uh, we uh, discussed the, the discharge and complications. Uh, the, these are the uh, surgical and post-operative parameters for the single versus multi-level. Um, as you'd expect, the mean uh, total anesthesia time as well as the estimated blood loss was slightly higher in the multi-level uh, patients. Um, just in the discussion, uh, there's been a growing uh, body of literature, and we're discussing uh, those today, reporting on the safety of spine procedures in ASCs, uh, so ACDF, uh, cervical foraminotomy, uh, single and uh, multi-level cervical ADR, uh, posterior uh, lumbar laminectomy and discectomies, MIST lifts, as well as laterals, uh, all being performed and discussed in the surgery center. Uh, so the results in this study were similar to those reported by uh, Gornet et al. Um, the authors in that study observed uh, one complication in uh, a one-level case and zero in their two-level cases. The anesthesia time in that article was 110 minutes average for a single level and 140 for two-level. This study average anesthesia time was 88 minutes, um, uh, which, which leads ideally to uh, less intraoperative and postoperative complications, shorter operative time, and maximal efficiency. There are obviously very many limitations to this study as it is a case series. It's retrospective, uh, so there's um, a natural selection bias for these patients that uh, are having surgery in the surgery center. Um, there's unreported uh, minor complications, uh, dysphagia can't be really quantified. Um, so in conclusion, uh, however, cervical ADRs can be safely performed in, in surgery centers um, it, with an experienced spine surgeon, efficient uh, surgical team, and strict patient selection criteria are critical in making all that possible. Thanks. So Christina, Great yeah. article. So I'll uh, assume the role of devil's advocate here. And I'll just, again, as a disclaimer, say that I'm a total fan of your center and of my TBI colleagues' um, operations. Um, one of our fellows here actually is a participant in both a retrospective study as well as uh, has co-published a, co a uh, article on airway compromise after anterior neck surgery. And this is a problem of small group analyses. Um, post the single biggest problem of outpatient anterior neck surgery is unexpected loss of airway after surgery. The time of onset, and Sven, correct me if I'm wrong, is sometime at around eight to 12 hours after surgery, so not within the first three hours. It's in the infamous night uh, after the surgery. The covariables are still poorly understood. The amount of volume to create this is actually surprisingly and shockingly low uh, 
correct me if I'm wrong, Sven, it's about uh, 50 cc's in the retropharynx that can be sufficient to cause significant airway compromise. We've actually created a PADS, a post-operative anesthesia uh, airway distress score as a result of that. So now the problem is the incidence. So when I tell you that the incidence is somewhere um, around uh, two in a thousand, the question becomes a, uh, a, a kind of statistical one. Uh, what is the price of safety? Is it okay if you get away with 147 patients, like in this case without an airway compromise? Or is two in a thousand enough to cause a significant concern? And that this is a concern is reflected in Rick Sasso, who we all love and admire and who's a frequent participant here, who published an airway distress algorithm uh, for outpatient surgery centers in the uh, Yellow Journal of the Academy uh, just three months ago. So uh, post-operative airway distress uh, address how that is uh, uh, kind of handled uh, and how this is ignored by this current publication. Thank you. Absolutely. I think uh, it only takes one patient you know, when, you, when you're looking at these uh, studies, and obviously uh, that didn't happen in this uh, consecutive case series, uh, but if, it, if you have one patient with airway distress and, and issues, that's, um, that's obviously a, a major concern for outpatient anterior cervical surgery. I didn't see that article uh, a few months ago that Rick, and Rick and I have always argued, Jens, about that, because um, Rick uh, did send the patients home the same day, and we tend to keep patients overnight. You know, when I started my training almost in the early 90s, <clears throat> we kept these patients in for two or three days. But <clears throat> currently, we, we just keep them overnight and let them go. And, and I assume there's a different standard in different facilities. What do you guys do in Texas about uh, anterior cervicals and sending them home either the same day or just overnight? You know, we've got a couple um, new guys in the group that were trained um, and did some ASC training and sent them home same day. But... The, the senior guys, you know, myself included, we do the same thing as you. We keep them over, overnight, send them home the next morning. Yeah. Jens, how long do you keep them there? Do you keep them until the protesters are done in Seattle? Right, <laughs> right. right. Um, we actually just keep them overnight, and uh, that pattern actually works very well. I'm very comfortable with that. It's, it's truly that night after uh, a surgery where the problems emerge. So I, I was actually not aware that all of you agree on this, but if you have a, a setup where you have the patient close by, have a contingency plan, or have uh, alerted healthcare providers who know what to look for for airway distress and can initiate appropriate response mechanisms that are graduated, that don't ring a five uh, alarm bell necessarily right away, then all is fine. I mean. The morning after, you have all the necessary prerequisites to make a safe determination for the patients for their homebound disposition or not. But, you know, our, our practice has changed. I mean, uh, Jack, how long did you guys keep these patients in the hospital in the 90s? Oh, well, you know, uh, traditional Henry Bowman training was they spent the first night in the ICU with a trach yeah. set at the bedside. Mm -hmm. So it took, you know, after a few years, you realize, boy, that's like a lot of waste of money. So we just kept them in a regular bed for overnight, but we're still with the trachs at the bedside. And what I was going to say is there's a bunch of 25 plus year spine surgeons in the, in the pictures, the thumbnails. Um, in my personal life, two times I've had to take patients back emergently the night of their surgery. Uh, for airway issues. Fortunately, both survived, both did okay. But I think if they were stuck on in 5 p.m. traffic trying to get back to the hospital as they were turning blue, um, neither one of them may have survived. So that's in my 30-year experience I've had to do twice. I don't know whether uh, you or Izzy or uh, Rick or Scott want to uh, say how many times it's happened to them. Well, I, I, I had one case, but I think the, the real difference is that we've learned from the ASCs they have to be very, very meticulous about uh, post-op or the intraoperative bleeding and getting hemostasis. And I think the newer chemicals like the flow seal or the surgery flow have made a big, big difference. I used to use a drain, even though we do keep them overnight, Mike. I used to use the drain all the time, but since using the flow seal and really being meticulous and letting it pack in there, and I'll do it a couple times, 
Uh, even in the post-op x-rays, they see very little swelling. So I think we've learned those techniques from the ASCs, although we still keep them overnight. Knock on wood, we haven't had one recently, um, but we're still careful. The, the only one that I recall over the years was actually a renal cell that uh, we did a decompression bled and uh, had uh, airway compromise that we had to take back uh, urgently um, to take care of. But one of the things that I'm uh, questioning to the, the audience that we have here, is anyone actually doing preoperative teaching with families uh, before they go home so they know what to, to look for? as well as is anyone comfortable sending them home with a drain overnight and just have someone pull the drain the next morning? Uh, is that an option? Does anyone think that's an option? Izzy, Izzy, well, let me, I, let me, I, let me, let me blow, pop that think... balloon. Let me pop that balloon right away. Uh, in our assessment, again, Sven sits with that nice blue hat, uh, two rows behind me, safely distanced. Um, uh, and Amir is behind us there. Hi, Amir. We end. There's a mirror. Um, Sven uh, published on this also. Uh, drains have no bearing on uh, retropharyngeal uh, uh, mass effects whatsoever, whatever their nature is. So drains are something that makes us feel better, but they have never been shown to actually reduce the incidence of uh, airway compromise. I mean, yes, let, let, you may not be able to show it scientifically, but help me understand, if you pull out 30 cc's out of the drain and you don't have the drain in that 30 cc stays somewhere and then coagulates so i mean it just makes common sense that the drain would have some impact how, how can you tell me that it has no impact i'm giving you the statistical assessment and again we're dealing with small group variances this is an eternal problem if you have five patients out of a thousand or two thousand you're basically dealing with a couple of variables and I completely agree, and I use drains whenever there's a question of oozing or uh, 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 situations, just because it is a safeguard, it's an additional safeguard. But again, in our literature, same as for epidural hematomas, drains have never ever uh, been shown to actually be a crisis avertant uh, median. Sven, back me up here. Sven gives me a thumbs up. Okay. But the question was really, would anyone be comfortable sending them home with a drain, which is a little different, whether it, it does or doesn't help. And quite frankly, I just bring it up as a question. I'm not sure I'd be comfortable doing that, uh, having someone go home with something sticking out of their neck and pulling on it and then all the other associated issues. We've, well, I, I had the experience of uh, seeing a back a two-week uh, post-op ACDF patient. This was many years ago. And uh, the fellow should have pulled the drain, and to, much to my chagrin, when I took the dressing off, the drain was still there. The patient didn't get an infection, and I subsequently talked to the ENT folks. They said, oh, yeah, we leave drains in the neck for a long time, especially with tumors and stuff like that. Uh, not a good thing to do, but it happens. I mean, I've done no, I don't that think a few it's an times. issue. Yeah, I've done that a few times. Uh, but Izzy, I mean, we have plastic surgeons who work at our office that send breast augmentations and abdominal plastics home with these drains all the time. And they take them out one or two days later. I mean, what's the difference? Yeah, maybe out of a net. It's our bias. Yeah. Okay. Great. Let's do the last one, which I think is about improving blood utilization in an ambulatory surgery center. This is a study that we did, and we pulled this together, and it was in a patient safety journal. Um, and it was really about is it reasonable to continue to have blood available? And the big concerns when you're doing anterior spine lumbar surgeries at these facilities where you may not have a blood bank on site uh, compared to that of the hospital. Okay, Clay. Thank you, Dr. Jansen. Thanks for your segue into that. Uh, like Dr. Jansen said, this was a study that I actually um, did as a resident several years ago with Dr. Jansen. We published it in the Patient Safety and Surgery Journal. Um, we looked at improving blood product utilization at an ambulatory surgery center and did a retrospective cohort study on 50 patients undergoing lumbar disc replacement. So I think to start out, I wanted to say that why this is important. Well, back, and this is something I really didn't know about until later in my residency, but back in 1975, Friedman et al. actually developed something called the Maximum Surgical Blood Ordering Schedule, which is kind of the guidelines on when you should type and cross and um, have blood on hold for patients. And they really did this to develop um, to increase the effective shelf life of a unit of packed red blood cells 
and decrease workload on workload on blood bank personnel. The goal was to decrease the time that a unit of packed red blood cells is in an assigned cross-match status, and their overall goal was to have a cross-match to transfusion ratio of two to one. I think this translates over into the ambulatory setting as one, you know, what is safe for the patient first and foremost, and two, like how can we improve our efficiency and contain costs as well. So for this study, we did, a, like I said, a retrospective observational cohort. We had 50 consecutive patients who underwent lumbar total disc arthroplasty at a single ambulatory surgery center. Surgery was performed by an orthopedic spine and general surgeon who have significant experience in the anterior retroperitoneal approach. Um, all the surgeries were done at the ASC and were all transferred from PACU to an attached convalescence care center, which has been mentioned a couple times, which will allow up to three days of observation postoperatively. Um, for this study, we included one or two level lumbar, lumbar total disc replacement between 2007 and 2018. All the surgeries were performed at this single musculoskeletal surgery center. We excluded people with previous anterior lumbar surgery, lumbar disc replacement, and in inpatient hospitals and patients less than 18 years of age. Um, for this, prior to surgery, all of our patients had a, a CBC. They were all typed and crossed with two units of packed red blood cells and held um, in a cooler at the surgery center the day of surgery. Um, it's our protocol here to get a CT angiogram of the upper, upper abdomen and pelvis. I believe Dr. Dada and Dr. Jansen actually published that study um, several years ago. Um, and all patients had cell saver utilized during their surgery. So out of 50 patients, um, we had 50 patients that had complete and preoperative, perioperative and immediate postoperative records. Um, when we went to our 30-day follow-up because of a transition in EMRs, only 35 out of 50 patients had complete charts for 30-day follow-up. And out of the 50, 48 were one level total disc arthroplasty. We had one two level total disc arthroplasty and one hybrid fixation with that was an L45 total disc with an L51 ALF. So for our results, we had no mortalities. Um, we actually didn't record any perioperative complications than these, specifically no uh, venous or arterial damage or uncontrolled bleeding at the time of surgery. No patient in the 50 patients had a allergenic blood product um, transfusion, which resulted in our uh, C to T ratio being much greater than two to one. Um, out of all 50 patients, we only had four or 8% that were retransfused from cell saver. Two patients received 200 mLs of retransfused blood and two patients received 400 mLs of retransfused blood. And not listed on this slide, but our um, maximum blood loss out of any patient was less than 500 mLs. All patients were eventually discharged home in stable condition. So I did want to point out there were three minor complications that were noted in the patients. One patient had an episode of dizziness with low oxygen saturation, but was asymptomatic um, after IS and was discharged home in stable condition. One patient noted to be hypotensive the night of surgery, but responded to fluid resuscitation, who again was discharged home in stable condition on postoperative day number one. And one patient became hypoxic in PACU and responded to Narcan with no further issues. For as far as our 30-day follow-up went, um, again, only 35 out of 50 patients had completed charts. Um, three out of the 35 patients um, ended up readmitted. One was for pneumonia, one was for AKI, and one was for pain and nausea. One additional patient ended up going to the emergency department for testicular swelling, but had negative studies and was uh, discharged home and no patient was readmitted for postoperative anemia. So this study, while it is informational, did have some significant limitations. Um, one, because we did the CT scans and all the CT scans are um, reviewed by our, vas our access surgeon, um, we're able to determine if that had a preselection bias on which patients went to the ambulatory surgery center versus who went to the inpatient hospital. Um, surgery was performed by a team that has significant experience in this technique and makes me question it, if you can actually generalize this data to the, to the general orthopedic spine community. Um, we did lack full 30-day data on all 50 patients, and I do believe our study was slightly underpowered um, since we didn't record any complications or anything. It's, it's hard to 
to make a true judgment on that. In conclusion, with new hemostatic technologies as well as cell saver technologies, we should reassess our utilization of all allergenic blood products. Um, things that I've discussed with Dr. Jansen and we discuss in the paper are whether you continue to have two units cross-matched and brought to the hospital versus keeping just um, universal uh, type O blood in a, in a cooler for the surgery center, which would decrease costs and decrease um, time that blood is out of the cooler in a cross-matched cross -match status. Um, and while this study supports decreasing the amount of blood that is cross-matched for anterior lumbar surgery, you know, we do have to recognize that um, there is some bias to this and it may not be applicable to the general community. And overall, I think this furthers evidence that anterior lumbar surgery is feasible and is safe in the ambulatory setting. Thanks, uh, Clay. I, I think the reason we brought this up is because, you know, at a surgery center, you have a, you have a responsibility, even at a hospital, I think, to be aware of the costs of everything that occur, whether you do monitoring, whether you have a cell saver, how much it costs to have the blood set up. And, you know, at our facility, every time they open up the cell saver, it costs our center about 1700 bucks. Every time we type the uh, direct cost at the lab, because my wife runs a transfusion medicine for the hospital systems, is 300 But when we set every, each unit up, it costs us almost 1300 bucks. So now we're having 1300 bucks per unit. We would send all this over. Then we would have cell saver set up. And we never once in 15 years ever transfused any of the patients. But we always had these units sitting there. We probably could have been more cost efficient to have a refrigerator where we had O neg, which we would give to the younger patients, females under 50, and then O pause just sitting there with a shelf life of six weeks. And maybe that may be more cost efficient for us rather than having all this backup all the time um, at a center, even though the hospital's directly across the street. Um, and I think those are the reasons we think we have to take a look is really do we need this available? on a regular basis. Now, Jens will probably bring up that it's no different than the cervical, you know, do you need to send all these patients home when the end number may be very, very small for a catastrophic issue? Um, but I think that it, it does bring us to look at the cost and should we be, what do we need? Do we need cell saver? Do we need blood? Do we need ONEG? Do we just need these for an emergency? Because, you know, we can go from zero blood loss, like most of these cases, to a lot of blood loss if you really, uh, unfortunately, have a problem. What do you think, Jens? I mean, you hit it on the head. I mean, preparation and anticipation uh, and risk stratification is the name of the game. And you guys have, again, clearly pushed the boundaries forwards. And having contingency planning is uh, part of any good surge. And you have to have a plan, an exit strategy, and a crisis management plan always in the back pocket. So uh, I'll stop there. There's a lot to say about that. but. Uh, I also have to say that this is a clear case of uh, major selection bias because I've seen you, I've seen my TBI colleagues operate. I know how incredibly reliable your surgical colleagues are, your anesthesiologists are. So the variables are minimized in those setups, which is a very big element uh, for the success. So having a functional choreographed team uh, that does the same thing over and over in a high uh, rate of repetition. Uh, is uh, uh, the true uh, key to success. So I'm not surprised that this is safe in your hands. Put this into any random academic center with uh, uh, most variables being uh, flurried about. Sig Bourbon couldn't be on the call today, but we have a great number of people there. Um, uh, it becomes a whole different ball game, you know, yeah, from, from every single element onwards, down to the blood bank, not having received your request for contingency planning, et cetera. How about a TBI? Do you guys have blood available when you do these at, a, at a, your ambulatory center versus the hospital? And if so, how many units do you have? Or do you just rely on cell saver? Or can you get access? Or do you keep an O neg and an O positive for the women that are childbearing age versus an O neg for everyone else, like a trauma protocol? Or, or what would be your uh, standards? Yeah, we, like, we, we, we just have cell saver available. 
Okay. Yeah, and, and we woke about uh, four or five years ago and realized it was silly to open it um, because there, there was like a $600 charge just for opening it. We never used it or rarely used it or rarely gave back. So we just have it in the room and only open it when you get a lot of bleeding because, you know, you, you can usually hang on to something while they're setting the cell saver up, um, and that so rarely happens. For the longest time, Mike, we didn't um, even type in and uh, cross patients for anterior procedures, and then we had one or two procedures um, that that did require some blood. So uh, our now protocol is to type and hold them just so that it shortens the time if you do need blood from the big hospital across the street, but still trying to keep costs down because it's so rarely necessary. You know, we as surgeons have to look at what we do. I mean, when we started doing these, when the, you know, discarthroplasty came out and we started doing this at the surgery center, the first thing the anesthesiologist says is, you're going to do what at a surgery center? And so he goes, okay, well, you're only going to do that if you've got two units of blood, and you got a cell saver, and you got tests, and then you just stay with that. And that's why this brought to the light for me, like, we don't need all of this every time. And you can look back, of, do you need that? I mean, recently when COVID came out, they wouldn't let us do anything at the surgery center unless everybody was tested. So we ran 125 patients, zero positive, and now we only test those that are symptomatic. So we, you can't just keep doing the same thing ongoing all the time and, and raise the cost unless you look backwards, was this reasonable, did it make sense, and was it cost efficient? Sometimes we forget about all those things. Hey, Mike, this is a great topic. Good articles, great discussion. Uh, thank you, everybody, for pre presenting. Uh, it was really uh, uh, something very enjoyable. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys. Yeah. Only two weeks left, and the summer's over when you hit Labor Day, so everybody be safe. Oh, that's right. Another couple weeks. Have a good weekend. Be All safe. Right. Thank you, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.